Hey, thank you for being here at Lapine Christian Center. We pray that this Palm Sunday video uh, recording will be of help to you. I don't know about you, but I'm having a great day, and I'm excited about what God has, what the message God has, and why God has a message for you and I today. And so let's get started. Let's get into this um, and let's pray. Let's begin with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray in the name of Jesus and God that you would come in power and in your glory and God that you would come in your healing power right now. The Lord, that you would bring your presence not only into this place, not only into my heart afresh, but God into the heart and life of everybody that's listening right now and that's watching this. And God, I pray right now that your special presence would come in. Lord, we know you're omnipresent. You're everywhere at the same time, all the time. But there is a place where you come in your special presence, where two or more are gathered together in your name. You're in the midst. Well, Lord, there's at least two of us here, uh, one listening, one receiving. There's actually four of us in the room right now. But Lord, there's more than that. Lord, there's your presence. And God, we thank you that that makes a minimum of three. And Lord, we thank you that you're here. You're here to help. You're here to heal. You're here to guide. You're here to direct. You're here to speak to our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Glad you're here. Don't forget, we're going to do communion towards the end. And I uh, just want to encourage you with that. If you haven't um, already gotten something to take, uh, receive communion together with us, um, don't make it too complicated. Just grab something you have in the house, uh, something that could be used for the body of Christ, the bread, and something that could be used for the, the, uh, the wine, the juice, the uh, whatever that would be. Uh, could be cranberry juice. It could be lemonade. It could be water. It could be whatever. The thing that's important is, is that you're doing something to connect with God. And um, so I just want to encourage you with that. The nice thing about watching this is you could pause it, go get the stuff and come back uh, when that time comes. And so in a few minutes, we'll be doing that. So today we're here to celebrate the triumphal entry of Christ, the triumphal entry of Christ. And Levi, would you go ahead and put that screen up about the triumphal entry of Christ? And in, and in this, um, as soon as it comes up, there we go, triumphal entry, it's Palm Sunday, and we'll get into why it's called Palm Sunday later on, uh, but we meet today in a day when, we're, when there are enemies to our freedom that are much the same as what the Israelites had in Jesus' day. There was corruption of leadership, there was strategic evil alliances, there was even a plague that was keeping people locked up and bound from true freedom. That plague was so intense, the people were crying out to God for relief. They were crying out to God for healing. They were, cre they were crying out to God for personal deliverance. And as a nation, even all creation was crying out to God, please help. And John the Baptist comes along and he comes on the scene and is right before Jesus' baptismal and all that. And John's a little, just a few months older than Jesus, his cousin. And John comes and he brings a message. Make straight the way, the paths of the Lord. And what he's saying is, will you make room? Make room for the Messiah. Make room for the Messiah. That's part of what we're going to talk about today. We need to make room for the Messiah. The Messiah. But the first, it, let's explore and seek out and strive to understand God's answer to the problem that the Israelites had in their day, to the problem that we have in our day, is that there's, our freedoms are bound up. We're bound away from some of our freedoms. And, and yeah, some of us, you know, during this time, this particular time, um, we're being bound in our homes in a way uh, to, to help protect, as, as the Lord said in the Levitical law and Deuteronomy when he was reteaching it. And he said, make sure that you do that which I have taught the uh, priest to diligently teach you so you diligently do. So you need to quarantine and you need to sanitize and do all those things. And I'm grateful to the Lord that he gives us those things. But we need to understand that at this time, there is a bounding up of our freedoms that there are those who are trying. The enemy of our souls is trying to get us to bind each other up from all that God has for us and what God wants us to have and all the blessings God wants us to have in our lives and all the freedoms and the strength and the power and the anointings of God. 
So we're going to explore today what is God's answer to that. And we're going to note God's ways and thoughts are not our ways and our thoughts. God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So how we think there's, it, there can be a cure to what's going on is not necessarily how God's going to do it. So first of all, we're going to look at, we're going to look in it from man's point of view. We're going to look in from man's point of view and, and the oppression and the grasping for relief that they had. Then secondly, we're going to look down from God's point of view about the discipline that he wanted to bring to cause life. Now remember, discipline, as most of us think about discipline, discipline's a harsh thing. But actually, discipline is a call towards virtue. It's a, it's a call towards doing what is right. It's actually it's taking action to cause those who are loved to do what is right um, and what's best. And then thirdly, we're going to look on, look on from creation's point of view about the abuse and misuse and the, the uh, longing for the revealing of the sons of God. So let's unwrap those just a little bit before we get into the rest of our scripture. So first of all, if we look in from man's point of view of the oppression in their day of Rome, Rome was kind of the plague of the day, uh, the way that they were oppressing the people uh, and, and the different leaders there, and the oppression of Rome, the grasping for the relief that the pe- that man was doing. So he was thinking most Israelites, most Jews at the time, of the uh of jesus coming they thought when the messiah was going to come he was going to conquer the plague of rome he was going to conquer the plague of oppression and he was going to conquer the plague of false leaders then looking down from god's point of view about disciplining to cause life the expectation god had was that when he sent the messiah that it would conquer the plague of spiritual apostasy Well, what's spiritual apostasy? Simply spiritual apostasy is those who know who God is, those who understand who God is, those who know his word, and yet they still turn their back on it and they still choose to live life on their own terms because they want to do it their way. And he wanted to turn that around. And then also uh, God's bent in the coming of the Messiah was to conquer the plague of spiritual oppression. You see, there was a lot of people, there were, there were those in leadership that were, um, and it wasn't just leaders, but there were mostly, the problem was the people in leadership who were trying to tell people, do this, 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 and this, when some of those rules were not even things God put together. They weren't even a part of God's list of things that were important. In fact, some of them were adding rules to the list so that they could make them have to give an offering to pay off that sin that they created. And so the Lord coming in all of his glory as the Messiah, God's bent was also to break that spiritual oppression, the spiritual oppression that came on by Satan, who took over the, the, uh, the authority of Adam to a degree Uh, when he got Adam and Eve to do what he wanted, he really became in charge at that point, and and Adam lost his dominion to a degree. But here's the deal. When when the Messiah was to come, God wanted to bring that freedom back to um, be in charge and to have authority again. And thirdly, God's bent on bringing the Messiah, sending the Messiah, was to conquer the plague of false spiritual leaders of those that would, that would teach just to get, those that would teach just, or those who wanted to be teachers, or those who wanted to be priests, those who wanted to be leaders, just so they could have some kind of a, a wear a special crown, or have a special stick, or have a special outfit on, or, or have a special name badge, or a, um, or a special title when they were greeted, oh, great rabbi, or, or whatever kind of garbage. Um, and I like how the Lord corrects that anyways, and we'll talk about that another time. But I love how the Lord stepped on their spiritual lips there. And then thirdly, when we look in from creation's, look on from creation's point of view about the abuse and misuse, that it was longing for the revelation of the sons of God. When the Messiah was to come, all of creation was longing for the conquering of man's uh, self-rule. 
What happens in man's self-rule? Well, what happens in man's self-rule is that we end up with problems because man says, well, this is how I can get away with this and I can get away with that and I can do this my way and I can do that my way. I can rule this way. I can judge this way. I can have, I don't have to have this kind of uh, forgiveness. I can have the forgiveness I want to give or whatever it is. And so uh, all of creation is just going, man, I can't wait for man's self-rule to end because man is not good enough to rule itself well. And then the creation looking on from its point of view is saying, man, I can't wait until the, conquer, the Messiah comes, conquers the plague of slavery to man's ways and abuses one to another and to even the world. And also the conquering the plague of man-made fertilizer. <laughs> now, I know I just lost all the teenagers right there. But here's the deal. Even all creation is longing for man to just live in ways that God said would work. Because you see, man keeps adding fertilizer, man-made fertilizer, to try to make things grow and do what they should do. But unless we do it God's way, it just won't happen. And, and all of creation is longing for that breakthrough. So before we get into the rest of the word, I just want to uh, say a couple things here. When Jesus triumphantly rode into Jerusalem as king to the people, and, and, and he declared, they declared several truths about him, we're going to read here in just a second. We're going to do an overview of what happened by reading a couple passages of biblical history to explore what happened and what it meant. And we're going to try to take some notes about these different scriptures. If you're taking notes, you're going to want to go ahead and write down and maybe get your finger in Matthew chapter 21. But we're going to read not all of these passages, but we're going to uh, refer to Matthew chapter 21, 1 through 11. Matthew 21, 1 through 11. Mark chapter 11, 1 through 10. Mark 11, 1 through 10. And Luke 19, 29 through 38. Luke 19, 29 through 38. And then finally, John 12, 12 through 18. John 12, 12 through 18. But when we begin, when, when we begin, we'll be a little bit ahead of the story as we seek to find out the benefits of following Jesus by making room for him in our hearts and lives. Levi, I'm going to need you to go on to the next slide, please. So in this, in this slide, what we see is we see Z Jesus is, is in the city and he sees this man named Zacchaeus. He enters Jericho and was passing through, and this is uh, Luke uh, chapter 19, verse 1, and Jesus entered Jericho, was passing through. There was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and was unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. In other words, he wasn't the shortest man in the country, and, you know, so he needed uh, vertical enhancers. I call those ladders because I use them all the time. So he ran ahead and he climbed into a sycamore tree in order to see Jesus, for he was about to, Jesus was about to pass through that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried, came down, and received Jesus gladly. Now, I just want to set a little bit of background. Zacchaeus, as a chief tax collector, was, well, he was rich because he was receiving more taxes from people than what they owed. What he was doing was what they would do in that day was the Romans said, you need to collect, let's say, a dollar tax from everybody. He, would rec he might collect $4 from everybody, but he had the Roman authority to do it. And if they didn't pay up, he could even imprison them or even have them killed. People knew that. So they had to give whatever they thought they could get away with asking. And let's go on to the next slide, please. So when they saw that they had begun to grumble... As he became the guest of a man who was a sinner, Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I'll give to you, the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone, 
If I've defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him today, Salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham for the son of man has come to seek and save that which is lost. You see, Zacchaeus received Jesus based on, first of all, what everybody else was saying. And he got interested based on what everybody else was saying. And then he, he wanted to see him for himself and he was making room in his heart for Jesus so much so that he even did the humble thing, climbed a tree so he could see Jesus. And I'm sure there was people who snickered at him. There were probably people who gave him a hard time, probably people who, who made fun of him maybe because he got up into the tree, probably not to his face because of his authority level and he could make life very bad for them. But there are probably people who sneered at him, like, who is this dirtbag who is trying to see Jesus? He probably just wants to see Jesus to know who to tax. But that's not how it worked out, is it? You see, this is what's important. Zacchaeus opened his heart up to give room for Jesus to enter triumphantly into his heart. And he was willing to give back, he was willing to give back more than even maybe he'd taken. And he says, Lord, all this, all this. And Jesus said, truly, truly, salvation has come to this house. So here we see Jesus coming into Jerusalem. Now this is part of a prophecy that was given many, many, many years prior ahead. And in this time, Jesus is coming in and it says, after Jesus said these things, he was going on ahead up to Jerusalem. And he approached, at, when he approached Bethphage and Bethany near the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village ahead of you. And where and there, as you enter, you will find a colt tied that no one has yet sat on. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he told them. This is Luke 19, now in verse 33. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus and they threw their coats on the colt, put Jesus on it. And as he was going, they were spreading their coats on the road. And as soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice. For with a loud voice, for all the miracles which they had seen, shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. I want to stop right there for a moment. I want to talk about a couple of things. You see, when they were putting their outfits on Jesus, when they were putting on Jesus their clothing, their cloaks, which was their outer coverings, when they were putting that on the donkey, not on Jesus, when they put that on the donkey, they were, they were saying to Jesus, you are of such high rank and of high value, and I have so much room in my heart for you and what you can do for me, and that I, I and some of them were saying it's because I love you. Some were saying because I want you to come and conquer Rome, as we talked about a little bit before. Who comes in the name of Yahweh, the King who comes in the name of Yahweh? See, there's a statement these people are making right here. When they're taking their cloaks off and they're putting them on the ground, when they're doing that, when they're putting, when they're taking off their best clothes. And they're laying them on the ground so that the donkey is walking on it and maybe even messing on it. And other people might be walking behind on those, their best clothes. When they're doing that, they're saying, You're, Lord, you are of greater value. You are of greater value than even my clothing to myself. Sorry if that made noise right there. But here's the thing. God wants us to recognize that he is of greater value. So when they did that, there's another thing they did here. When these people said, 
Blessed is the king who comes in the name of Yahweh. They knew he was of the family in the line of David. They expected that when the Messiah came, who was supposed to come of the family in line of David, that when he came, that he would overcome the rule of Rome, that he would actually take over the rule of the world. And at that time, which was to come later, but anyways, when they made that statement, they just put their lives on the line. When they made the statement that blessed is he who comes, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, what they just said was, we recognize Jesus as our king. At that moment, they were in trouble and very possibly could have been killed and crucified for calling Jesus their king because Roman law said that you couldn't that nobody could be a king except for Caesar. Now there was of course there was you know King Herod and those guys they were only puppet kings they were basically governors in a way they were they were regional kings but they were not high kings. But this, in here, they're saying, blessed is the king, the high king, who comes in the name of the Lord. They're putting their lives on the line. And there's something that happens in a little bit, is that when Jesus came into town, when he got into Jerusalem, and he got into the temple, he didn't go sit down in authority. Instead, what he did, what kind of went home and he came back the next day and he and he he sent out those that were selling and and doing things wrongly in the temple and he said you know you guys need to get out of here my kingdom is or my my house should be called a house of prayer not a house for sales and people had a problem with that and let's let's go on from here then it goes on to say in uh Luke 19, in verse 39, Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Jesus answered, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. So when he approached Jerusalem, uh, the, he saw the city and he wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day, even you, the things which would make for peace, but now they have been hidden from you, from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up against you a barricade and surround you and hem you in on every side. And they will level you to the ground and your children within you. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation, beloved, today. I've been getting phone calls and I've been getting contacted by people from all over the place that are saying, I don't want to die and go to hell. I want to, it, it, if I die from this COVID virus, if I, if I die, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go be with Jesus. You see the, the difference here, or the, what we're talking about today is this. If we don't allow Christ to have a triumphal entry in our lives, we're going to have the same vote of condemnation or the same word of condemnation over us is because we did not recognize the time of our visitation. And I'm not, what I'm trying to say is just simply this, is it there's a reason God's trying to get a hold of your heart right now. There's a reason that you're thinking about the Lord right now. You're, there's a reason that the Lord is knocking on the door of your heart and saying, would you let me in? Would you let me come in and sup with you and hang out with you? Because if you will do that, you will find that when he comes in, there is great freedom that you can have in your life. Go on, Levi. And look what, look what Jesus continued to do. He was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests and scribes and the leading men among the people were trying to destroy him. They could not find anything that they might do for all the people were hanging on every word that Jesus said. Stop there. So here's the thing. The people were making room for Jesus in their heart, but the highly religious people, and we all know him, the highly religious people, they didn't want to make room for Jesus to be in charge because if Jesus is in charge, they can't be. They didn't want to make room for God to, to be himself in his house. They didn't want to make room for all of God's word. And let me tell you, even today, you know as well as I do, there are people who don't want 
you to know all of God's word because then they can't be your Jesus. Jesus gets to be your Jesus. But I thank God that I can spend time in his word and he invests it in my heart. And after he has invested well and he has, he has chipped away the stuff that, that is not like him and he's, he's molded me and made me and chiseled me into a masterpiece, which someday I'll be when I get to be with him. But what he does is he's changing my heart. And then the best thing is he changes my heart to then share. And that's all he wants to do. He wants people to grow. He wants people to go beyond what they think is possible. So let's look at this again. When we looked in from man's point of view, man was hoping, praying, crying out that when the Messiah comes that he would conquer Rome. But that wasn't what Jesus was here to do. In fact, Peter believed it just like everybody else. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter did what most of us wish we had the guts to do is when they tried to arrest Jesus wrongfully, when they were wrongfully accusing him and wrongfully attacking him, Peter pulls out that sword and cuts off the guy's ear. And some of us are like, yeah, that's, that's what I would do. But Jesus had to heal Malchus's ear and, he, and so that Peter couldn't be arrested because there wouldn't be any evidence. Peter, that, that God had to do that. And here's the deal, instead of conquering Rome, Jesus wanted to restore the kingdom of God. Well, the kingdom of God is, is it's in this world, but it's not of this world. The kingdom of God is, is universal reign. The kingdom of God is, is you and I. God want, the Lord wants to come in, and He wants to rule and reign over our hearts. He wants to rule and reign over our lives. He wants to rule and reign over everything. Not because He wants to be in charge, because He's the only one who knows how to do it. He's the only one who knows how to get from A to B. And when the Messiah comes, God's bent, or, or again, man's point of view looking in over the oppression and grasping for relief as their expectations was that God would conquer the plague of the oppression, but yet God just wanted to refresh man's authority. You see, God wanted to refresh man's authority so that the, the authority that Adam gave up, you could have it back in Christ. And when Jesus makes the triumphal entry as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, as what we call the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, when he came into that city and he made that statement that I am the king by coming in on a donkey through the king's gate, it was all prophesied ahead of time, but it's how they would, they would, they would prepare to crown a king. And when Jesus did that, people had the chance to receive him as Lord and Savior and understand they could walk in the authority that God wanted them to have. Thirdly, again, he came to, uh, man was crying out through the oppression of some of what we deal with today, of the false leaders. God wanted to come in and reset and bring clarity. Clarity of what? Not clarity of... Uh, Clarity of your thoughts, yes, too. But God mostly wanted to come in and clarify what is right and what is wrong. What is appropriate? What is, what's good teaching? What's bad teaching? You know, one of the reasons they killed Jesus was because he kept correcting their teaching. Because the religious leaders of the day, and some of it can happen in our day, too, people teaching what will make them become popular with others. But the Lord came in and he kept correcting those things in their teaching where they would, they would see maybe a rich man come in and they would, they would say certain things for that rich man, but they would say other things for the poor. That's not how Jesus works. Jesus came to correct that. Jesus came to go against the false leaders and reset and bring clarity to what he really meant by what he said. And again, from... God's point of view, looking down at man and, and wanting to bring life. He, he sent the Messiah to conquer the plague of spiritual apostasy. And he, this is all he wanted to do. He just wanted to restore the relationship. He just wanted to restore the relationship 
Levi, go to the next slide if you would. He just wanted to restore the relationship. That's why when he came into town in different times, and like I remember the one time when Jesus came in um, and, and he was sitting down and they're bringing little kids to him and he was actually letting them sit, get on his knee um, or he would embrace them. And there were even his disciples who were going, hey, stop that. He's talking to us. I love Jesus because he goes, and Jesus, it says Jesus got indignant. He was upset. He goes, don't you dare inhibit these little ones from coming to me. Don't you dare do that. Because the whole reason he came was to reestablish relationship with his people, the people of the world. First, the Jews, and then what's called the Gentiles. The difference is a Jew is someone who claims to be a, a follower of Judaism or God, um, of Yahweh. But then there's the, what was called Gentiles. And all that term means is somebody who doesn't know God or doesn't follow God. And so Jesus was coming to restore, first of all, the relationship with his closest children, the Jews, um, that he had set aside for his glory uh, to do a lot of things through. But he also wanted all the people of the world to know that he loved them and he wanted to restore that relationship. And secondly, God's bent was to conquer the plague of spiritual oppression and again, refresh authority. That's coming up uh, again because... God wants you to walk in authority. He wants me to walk in authority. When we pray, when we serve God, we have authority that man doesn't understand. We have authority to pray and see people heal. We have authority to, to, um, uh, to expect God to do great things. We have authority to stand firm. In fact, the scripture says if you don't stand firm, you won't stand at all. Then when the Messiah came, he came to conquer the plague of false teachers. Jesus came to reset that, and he brought clarity. And what is the model of life? It's love. It's compassion. Jesus said this, God, his Father, God the Father said this before. Jesus said it while he was here. And, and they both said the same thing. I desire compassion, not sacrifice. You know what he's saying? I desire that you have compassion one for another. And I desire obedience. In other words, lovingly following him. I desire these things. The sacrifice, that's not as important. He wants us to bring sacrifices, um, not the same as they did back in the Old Testament, but he wants to bring, you know, whether it's our tithes or whatever it is, but he wants to bring the sac he wants us to bring like the sacrifice of praise which is something we choose to do and then we enjoy doing. But he wants us to do that because it's best for us, not because it fulfills some religious line in a book. It's because he wants us to have the best possible life. He wants us to let him have a triumphal entry into our heart so that we would have a model life that others can follow as well. And then back to creation's point of view about being sick of the abuse and longing for the revealing of the sons of God and the expectation it has that when the Messiah comes to conquer the plague of man's rule, that the, um, the, the heresy, the, the, the heresy, of, the, of man's rule, the way that man would, they would give one rule and they live by a different rule and so on. But, but God wanted relationships restored. You know, one of the problems that happens in our day is that when people get in authority, and our forefathers of the United States said this, many, 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 many of them said this, if you do not hold us accountable for the way we act and the type of authority that we have and so on, if you don't hold us accountable, you will have the same problem that we just conquered and had to fight off to, get, to make this country. And when the Messiah come, creation was longing for the slavery of man's abuse to go away and freedom to refresh purpose. Do you know this morning I saw a sunrise that was gorgeous? It was at around seven something this morning and it only lasted a few minutes and it was interesting right after that the sky was very gray 
and kind of bleak. And I thought to myself, you know, this is like my walk with the Lord. When I get that time to take with Him to be refreshed, I get that, wow, sunrise that happens in my life. What a perfect correlation. But, you know, if you don't get up and spend time with the Lord, or you might be a night owl, you do it at night, I have to do it in the morning. But if you'll take that time to be with the Lord early in the morning, and you'll, maybe you'll see some sunrises. Every once in a while I get up so early, if the moon and the sun are at the right increments, um, sometimes I see the moon rise first and then the sun. Actually, I see a star and then the moon and then the sun. Um, that's a pretty early day. And lastly... Creation's point of view from the misuse and abuse is this, is getting over the plague of the slavery of man-made fertilizer. You know, that sounds funny. And again, I, I, I'm sure maybe some would snicker to that. But here's the deal. Do you know if we just do what God said to do with our land, if we give it a Sabbath rest, I have friends that do that. And they don't use the fertilizers and they don't use the um, uh, sprays and stuff like that like a lot of other people do. They don't have to. Because when you give the land a sabbatical, when you give it a, a, a seventh year off, when you let it rest like God said so. In fact, one of the things he even said, he said this, like when you grow a fruit tree, I think you can't even eat the fruit until like the third year or fourth year, whichever it is. And, and the reason for it, he says, the reason why is so that tree will produce more fruit over more years. So apparently that fruit falling off of that tree is actually causing the tree to become more nutrient and uh, to have more nutrients so it could do better. Because God wants to reset so we can go rest, work, we can go and work hard so we can rest well. So at the end of all this, at the end of all this in the, in the triumphal entry of the Lord into our lives, at the end of all this, one of the things we get to do is we get to make the choice, and we'll talk about it obviously more next week because next week's Easter. But as we talk about Easter, we need to remember it's not just a story. It's a historical event. It's a historical event of what God did. It's an absolute, clear historical event. There's even books that are written about what Jesus did that are, that are not part of the Bible. And, and history of that time proves out that Jesus lived and that he did what he did. And so one of the things we're going to do today, because this is our first Sunday and, and we might do it next week too. But anyways, one of the things we're going to do today is we're going to receive communion. And in communion, we have these elements. You've seen these different trays. These trays are used for bread. And these trays are used for the juice. And actually, it also has bread in it. And in here, you'll see that there's juice representing Jesus' blood. And there's bread, which represents Jesus' body. And what we're doing with this is that we're commemorating what Jesus did in his death, burial, and resurrection, but also his life. You see, when Jesus went to the cross, on his way to the cross, he was beaten and abused in horrific ways. And, it, and it's good for those who have been abused to be able to say, Lord, I think, I, I, I know maybe you didn't go through exactly what I went through, but at least you know what it's like to be abused by somebody who should have been treating you the best. You see those highly religious leaders? They should have been the ones that treated the Messiah the best. But instead, they were the ones trying to kill him because they wanted to be in charge. Beloved, I thank God for leaders who don't care to be in charge, but for the ones who just want to serve. Jesus didn't come to be in charge. He came to serve. And he became servant of all. And he was beaten and abused. And then, of course, 
They had grape juice, wine, whatever it was. But what they had is Jesus took that cup and he said that this is my blood. It represents my blood that is poured out for the new covenant. This is a representation of my blood that's going to be poured out for the whole world for many. And to do this in remembrance of me, if you've ever been to a church and you've seen these tables that say in remembrance of me, that's exactly what it's talking about. This is a communion table. We have it um, and it's beautiful. Somebody did a good job on it. But you know what's the most beautiful thing about communion is that Jesus' presence is with us when we take communion. It's not a happenstance thing. We should never do it flippantly or like it's as common as putting your shoes on every morning. But it should be something we do out of love and reverence and appreciation for who Jesus is. Now, I'm going to ask if I could get some help here in a minute because I have three helpers in here that I would like to come and have uh, take receive communion with me. And um, so... And I didn't ask them to dress up and get all pretty for everybody. The only reason I'm dressed up like this, I tend to do this on first Sunday because it's communion Sunday because in the tradition of how I grew up, that's what we did. But you know what? If I was wearing jeans and a, and a uh, uh, maybe a uh, fishing jacket and a funky fishing hat and, and a, oh, here you go. <laughs> <laughs> all right so <laughs> so here we are to receive communion and i pray that that you've gotten a chance to prepare and if you haven't go ahead and pause here just pause and then go grab something i don't care if it's crackers or bread or grab something to represent the body of christ and grab something to drink so that we can do that together So as we've talked about the triumphal, of entry, triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem as King of kings and Lord of lords, I want to challenge you today to be like Zacchaeus was in Jericho who climbed up into that tree to see Jesus and then he received him with his whole heart. He opened up his whole heart because before we receive communion, what is important is we have to be a believer. And now maybe you come today and you've been a believer and you've not been walking well with God and, and you think to yourself, well, I'm not qualified. Well, none of us are qualified. Except when we ask Jesus to be our Lord and Savior or we rededicate our hearts to follow him with all of our heart better than we've been doing before, when we do that, we're qualified. But if you haven't asked Jesus into your heart and this is the moment where you're feeling like God is calling you right now to do that, I just want you to close your eyes and bow your head um, if you feel comfortable with that and just pray these words after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you and I believe you died on the cross for my sin. I want your forgiveness and I thank you for it. Lord, I ask you to forgive me of everything I've done that was not in ways you would do it. I thank you now for forgiving me. Now, Lord, I ask you to lead my life. Be my Lord. Be my leader. Be the one that's in authority 
over my life for good. And I thank you for saving me right now. In Jesus' name, amen. If that's the first time you've ever done that, would you please send us a note on the links that will be included on our page here? Um, would you please let us know, or you can call into the church, 541-536-1593, uh, or you can send us a note at P.O. Box 349 Lapine. But the thing that's important here is that you let us know, let, let somebody know you, that you've come to Jesus and then ask for help to get to know him better. Stay connected with us. So I'm going to ask my guys here, these are three of my sons, I'm going to ask them to receive communion with me today, and I pray you'll do the same thing. So um, I'll take that out so you guys don't touch the one I touched. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, on that night, so I want to read this passage real quick to you from 1 Corinthians 11 and 23, for I received from the Lord, that's what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. So what he's saying is, this is the body, um, this is a representation of my body for what I'm going to do for you. Let's go ahead and partake of the bread together. In the same way, he took the cup, also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. But before we get to this step, one of the things this passage also says is we're supposed to examine our heart before God. And if there's anything in us that we need to get right with God, this is the time to do it. And so, Lord, we come before you right now. Lord Jesus probably should have done this before we took the bread. But, Lord, we come to you right now. And if there's any sin, whether we know it or whether we are unaware of it, we ask you to reveal those things to our heart and mind so that we can repent, turn our back on those things, and go your way, do things your way. And so, Lord, we come to you in repentance and say, Lord, I'm sorry, and Lord, I want to get it right. And so, Lord, would you do a work that I can't? Would you help me to walk with you all the days of my life? In Jesus' name. And then he, he took that cup and he said, share this amongst you. Do this in remembrance of me. He says this, as, long as, you, as often as you drink this cup and eat this bread, you do it in commemoration of what I've done. And he says this, and he says, remember, I'm coming back is part of the... And so it says, the, the scripture goes on to let us know that now we can celebrate the Lord. We can celebrate our, first our salvation in the Lord. We can celebrate dedication and rededication. And we can celebrate because of the love and the joy of God that's in our hearts and the blessings. And don't forget this. You are truly loved. God loves you very deeply. He loves you very much. And he's given us a love for the people of God as well and for all of his kids. And I want you to never forget this. You are important and you have extreme value. No matter what goes on in the days to come, God loves you and he wants you to have the very best. So God bless you. Thank you for being here today in Jesus' name.